So I'm delighted to talk to everybody about publishing with efficiency. And I'm Nancy Pondy. I'm professor and vice chair of research at the University of New Mexico Department of Family and Community Medicine. Sorry. Okay. There we go. All right. And I'll be talking to you today about the writing process and really um, getting a little bit in the weeds about how do you think about what journals are you going to publish in? How do you think about who your co-authors are and what support you need to get that out the door? Um, I know we have a range of experiences, so I'll do, you know, some of this might be really basic, so I apologize for people with a lot of experience, but I, I'm going to do a little bit of a deep dive on the different sections just because it can demystify it. Um, and then we'll talk about kind of how you might be a good co-author when you finalize your submission and how to work in a team. So the first thing I like to spend actually some time on is choosing journal targets, because if you can get good at this piece of it, um, you can save yourself a lot of pain in terms of the time and having to resubmit and resubmit over and over. So for each one of these, I kind of will bring you to the key questions I think about um, for each section and then, you know, how I go about it. So, you know, we've perhaps heard this before, but really it comes down to what audience do you want? to be reading your journal. You know, I think most of us as family docs are really, um, and clinicians are really into like, what impact are we gonna have when we write it? And that's why we're bothering to write it and get it out of out the door. And so if we know who we wanna have the conversation with and make sure that that's a match for the people who read the journal, that can be really helpful. Then there's practical considerations, right? And I think, you know, how quickly do I want to get this into print? So journals have different frequencies in terms of how often they publish. And even on right now with COVID in particular, the review process can be really, really slow. So if you're trying to get something published, let's say for your promotion, it's good to have a sense of, you know, how long is this going to take to get out there? Um, this one people don't really talk about, but I think it's really critical about what's your tolerance of rejection. And this is really personal. Some people really feel encouraged if the first thing they get out there is sure to get published, right? And then there's other people who have a little bit more of, I don't care, I want to get this into, you know, the most prestigious journal or the, the biggest audience. You may have a different approach to how you think about the tolerance of rejection. So for that, I want to, um, you know, just having some time to think through that, and we'll talk through how you sort that out a bit, um, can be really helpful. And then most importantly, I think more and more this is becoming a consideration about do you have the resources to pay for open access journals or journals with per page fees. And it used to be a bit of like a stigma around, oh, pay for publish, but now so many reputable journals are actually charging an open access fee. It becomes more just of a practical consideration um, for certain audiences. A brief mention to spotting the predators. I will send out slides for everyone so you, we don't have to spend time, but there are, um, I've included some links. So there's good compilations of these journals that, you know, they sound great and sometimes they have really impressive names. I also put this funny little email. You can also spot it. Generally, if you're somebody's reaching out to you, they do pretty funny things in terms of, uh, you know, over the top emails and how important you are, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, if you're getting those, I always chuckle at those and, um, you know, you generally know that, okay, probably not a legit journal. They just want the money from publication. We've heard this a couple different times, but I, you know, Jane is such a useful tool that I thought it was worth mentioning again. You know, Jane is super helpful. All you have to do is even put just a title or you can put keywords in there and you're, they're going to pop up for journals for you as suggestions. So I often suggest to people that this can be like a great place to start unless you already know like, oh, I only want to publish in a family medicine journal. Then, you, you know, you know, your options are relatively smaller. But if you're interested in a broader um, audience, that can be helpful. This one too, many people don't know about this, but the Web of Science Master Journal List is actually awesome as another place to look for um, ideas. They do this thing that you can match your manuscript. So this is a good one if you've been rejected a couple times. Um, they will actually, this matching manuscript is really helpful or um, they actually have a, a great journal search and it looks into not just our, our PubMed type journals, it really goes across like clinical journals, 
as well. Um, and the best thing is that they've curated it. So you are sure they're, it's only high level of editor, they say here, editorial rigor and best practice. So um, lots of open journals, you know, I definitely use this quite a bit, um, especially earlier uh, when I was not as familiar with like the audiences and the journals that I wanted to work with. The other resources, and I've included some lists, so there are people who've taken the trouble to compile journals for you. So I love this one around, you know, publishing quality and safety content. It keeps going. I, you know, we just um, abstract the first couple of journals that are on that list, but they have, I think, over 20 or 30 journals that are really friendly for QI. It's a slightly older list. It was compiled both by UCSF and um, Michigan actually has it on their webpage as well, so included the link. Um, and then Global Health, which I know is a passion for many people here. There's, this is a nice um, grouping of the different Global Health journals. So you can get a lot of your work done, you know, if you have a topic and you just see if there's a compilation. Okay, so once you've, what I generally recommend is picking three different journals that you're going to publish in. You know, that's pretty realistic in terms of the number of times, unless, you know, you really want to get published and you're just going to go for a simple journal that probably publishes a lot. Um, and I generally say pick your three and then, you know, what you're trying to do is figuring out what's the fit to what you want to do. And the places you look are the information for author section and then actually the journal itself in the most recent couple of issues to see if they're publishing similar topics and methods. So, you know, just to give an example of what that looks like, I just pulled up, you know, Journal American Board of Family Medicine. Um, and it's very specific there, right? They are looking for authors with new knowledge to contribute to advancement of family medicine research and clinical practice. So if your topic isn't very specific to something that could you can make a case that this is applicable to family medicine, it probably doesn't belong in this journal. And then this other thing that I've highlighted, right, six month bi-monthly issues per year. So the timing of what, how long it's going to take to get out into the actual print is going to take a while for this journal. So that's kind of the level of the scanning that you're doing, right? Who's the audience and, you know, what's the time of publication? You also would go through their different features, you know, and I just wanted to highlight for um, folks who might be newer, there's often journals have a lot of different creative ways to be scholarly. So even though I'm a researcher, you know, I, I've written narratives and published them. I, I like doing writing generally, right? And, and it can sometimes feel a lot more approachable maybe to do something, send in your essays or prose or poetry, you know, professional experiences. Something like that can go into a journal um, and then, you know, these letters, right, which are very short and they have very specific things. So research letters or brief reports, which is clinical relevance. You know, there's a lot of options to pick different topics. It doesn't just have to be this original research um, category. I did want to make a note about review articles. You know, so many people are um, starting with a review if you're trying to understand a topic for the first time is often something that can be suggested, but it's a little challenging sometimes to publish clinical reviews. Um, and I wanted to just say that, you know, really paying attention to the type of review because um, more and more journalists prefer the systematic review approach. Um, as preferred, which actually, you know, takes a, a certain level of rigor as you go about it um, is important. Okay, so going through the specific journals, right? So one thing that I've seen people often um, kind of forget about is that there's link limits on many types of journals. And so, you know, it, I don't know about you all, but it can be really painful when you have to go down and cut your, you've written like 3,000 words, you love your words, you're ready, and then you're like, oops, it's only supposed to be 1,500 words or less. So um, making the time to really know what they want is, in terms of word limits, is critically important at the beginning. So I wanted to show you, like, so I mentioned it's, I like picking three different journals and comparing their instructions as you're thinking about that in terms of, you know, here's my high reach journal that I think I'm going to go to first. Here's another one I might go to second and my third. And if you get a sense of how similar the requirements are, that might also help you choose your three. Because if you're going to get rejected and you just have to turn around and reformat and they're very similar, that makes your life a lot easier. So you can see in our um, 
a couple of our family medicine journals, you know, that there is a bit of a range, right? So Annals of Family Medicine, you know, has three to six, Family Medicine has up to five, you know, so if I were personally like formatting and going, oh, I think I want to write for a, a family medicine audience, I would make sure that I had only five figures so I had a chance to get into all three, you know, just, so these are sort of like the practical ways of approaching it. Um, this authorship thing is critical, right? So JBFM limits to no more than eight authors. So again, you know, if, if you know that going at the outset and you're thinking about your writing team, you it would be horrible, I think, to have to kick an author off, you know, sorry, we're gonna reformat good to this journal. So, you know, keeping that in mind as, oh, I'm gonna make sure I have eight authors and no more from the outset is important. And then you can see different things with length and then, you know, keywords as well. Um, so the second part of the process I mentioned was around scanning for similar topics and methods. So I'm just going to give an example of how I would do that. You know, it's an old paper of mine, but, um, you know, so let's say I was doing a survey, right? And I want to make sure that the journal that I'm publishing in is actually comfortable with, you know, a random mail survey. So um, the survey happened to be distributed by mail. So I, you know, looking at three journals around that time and yep, there's like at least in the past couple issues there's been these other postal questionnaires you know so it doesn't have to be a huge you know big deal but if you can find examples of people who are using similar methods then you know at least that reviewers will probably be comfortable with your approach on some level and I actually generally do pull those kind of articles if I pick, you know, again, three that are similar, just to get a sense like what level and like it's of detail do um, those different journals want the methods in. And I'll get into that in just a moment. So this is a place where I'm going to go ahead and pause and just see if there's any questions about the scoping process, because you know, I think this is a place where it's sort of like quality improvement, right? We always say like, spend some time at the very beginning, you know, like we often want to rush into doing the thing that we do, the intervention or the writing the paper. But I think the strategy of, of slowing down and figuring out how to scope will definitely save you time. Any questions about that part or experiences with that? Okay, not really seeing too many, so I'll just. When I work with students, I really encourage them, and and I do the same thing myself to um, get the the template off of the target journal that you're shooting for. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I we're in the middle of one right now for. Um, I think it's for family medicine. Yeah, I think it's family medicine, and and it basically says in your introduction you should answer these five questions. You know, it's kind of like. I take the outline with the word count limit and stuff and I make it, I, I put that down first as like my first step on the word document. Yeah, I think that, yeah, that's great. That, um, and kind of re totally reinforces this thing because it makes it more doable, right? Like that's the thing. I think if we sit down with a blank page, I think it's like, oh my goodness. But if you realize like, oh, it's only a few paragraphs and I've got to answer these questions, it makes it much easier. So the next part is I'm just going to go through sort of writing in teams because I feel like that generally most family physicians tend to do that in terms of our and clinicians. Sorry, I, you know, I know we're not all family physicians in this group, but family physicians and folks who are in family residence and medicine residency or education programs tend to do. So here's the things that I have found really critical for um, being successful when writing in groups. So the first, you know, there are very strict um, authorship guidelines generally that all journals have agreed to of what constitutes an author, author or not, and they're all, always listed on the page. And But I think figuring that out at the beginning is really critical or how you're gonna decide the folks in the middle, right? So who's the first author? Senior author often means a certain thing in our promotion processes, you know. And then um, this part about making sure people can forget because these projects go on forever. So I just personally sort of have a rule that every time a draft or an outline goes out to co-authors, we're gonna have that authorship order there on those on no matter what, you know, so there's just no question about it from the beginning. 
Um, and then I generally talk about, you know, discussing up front what the roles and responsibilities are. So typically what would be, right, the first author, of course, takes all responsibility of the content. You might be the kind of person as a first author who says, you know, I'm going to mostly write it and then I'm going to send it to others to contribute. Or you're going to truly do more team writing depending on the project, right? Somebody does a section, somebody else does a method, somebody does an analysis, somebody makes figures, and everybody has to comment on the final product, you know, as part of authorship. Um, um, I, I get that this is different for different places and resources, but there's a lot of tasks related to writing that just aren't, um, I would say, like tasks that, that require the scientific piece of it. So if you can get anyone, an undergrad, and someone, you know, uh, somebody's like a research assistant, even if it's a volunteer, you know, that you acknowledge in terms of acknowledgments to help you with formatting, getting your references in there and checking them and then actually like entering everything in the online submission, um, totally worth your time to try to offload that piece of it. Cause that's really does take a couple of hours, that, you know, or more depending on what your paper is, but you really don't need to be doing that if you have, can get somebody trained up to do help with that. Also, I generally do this with my groups. We have an authorship kickoff meeting, and this is where we actually hash out what those authorship order is gonna look like. Um, what's fun is like letting people leave with something actionable at the end of that meeting. So we all agree on a title. That's kind of just a fun thing we can do together. So it establishes us as, as a team. Sometimes, depending on how far the project is, like we mock up blank tables, like, okay, we're, we've, you know, we've got five tables here, and then we talk through the different spots of an outline. Um, we also set up timetables, right? So what are people's considerations of when we need to get this done? And then when's the first draft due? Um, we even talk to you, like, what's the response time when a draft is sent out? I know so many colleagues where the biggest issue has been they send it out to co-authors. Co-authors are continually busy because we all are, and papers just languish for weeks and weeks. So as much as you can talk through that process with your group up front, like, two weeks and if you can't make that deadline please email us you know and let us know what's reasonable again building an accountability to writing can be critical um and then we've heard of a couple different examples of how you can work together so one thing that i really have been using more and more especially as people are comfortable with zoom um, or other web-based platforms has been this idea of time blocking and writing as a group. So we block off a couple of hours where everybody agrees to be there. We just say hello to each other kind of socially, check, you know, check in real quick for the five minutes or 10 minutes of that time. We go off camera, we all write on that paper, and then we come back at the very end and we talk about what we've done towards that paper if we've had questions. So that's gonna be kind of a really successful way from my experience to get busy people to move papers along that we're working on together. Um, other people do you know, work successfully individually and then you just occasionally check in. Um, but still, I would encourage having that block time on the calendar to do that occasionally if you're trying to group write. Otherwise, you know, these can be a bit of a challenge because often people really do struggle with all the different competing demands for writing. I'm getting pretty in the weeds here, but, you know, I wanted to show you how I send an email out, you know, with um, co-author planning, right? So you get a notice, like a revise and resubmit, you know, really clear last date we can send this manuscript in um, is this I need your approval by that and then here's where I need some help right and then the expectation that everybody has to read the final draft and approve it prior to the resubmission um, and then often you know people who are willing to volunteer and help out at that extra level we just do a quick web call so you know trying to be as clear as possible with this accountability can just be helpful um, with this process Okay, so now I'm going to move on to the second part. Welcome um, for folks who joined us in between here. Um, so I'm going to move on to the second part, which is just, and I, again, this might be familiar for those of you who have published, but sometimes just having another look at it or a reminder is helpful. I'm going to do a deep dive on like the different parts of the sections and just the questions to answer. I know um, the questions are often, as Kareem was saying, like, present in some of the journals themselves, but I'm, I think I've abstracted some of these at a higher level of like 
what's the point of these different sections? So hopefully this is helpful. And I wanna acknowledge a lot of people have talked about writing. So um, if I've inadvertently plagiarized because this is like, some of this is like cookbook and science, I apologize in advance. I promise I made my own content and didn't think of that, but a lot of these concepts are, are sort of core in writing for everybody. Okay, so introduction sections, right? So what's the big question? What did you do? Why did you do it and who cares? I mean, it really comes down to that. By the time you're done reading that introduction, you should know the answers to those three questions as a reader. Um, a finer point on that is to use literature that's current, you know, and when possible, and we heard this from our editors earlier, you wanna use references from the journals that you plan to submit to. So going back to the scoping process, right? You wanna make sure that when you have your list of three of uh, journals that you're gonna potentially publish in, you know, you wanna make sure your lit search is really thorough among those journals so that you can cite those. And there, there's a practical reason for that, right? That's how they're gonna find some reviewers potentially at those journals. Um, and people, you know, honestly like to be cited. It makes you feel good and people know your work. And so, you know, there's a little bit of a strategy piece of being able to do that. And it also, again, helps to make sure that you're fitting in with that journal in terms of scoping. Okay. So the next part is having, you know, this is the, in, the inverted pyramid. So hopefully, I don't know if folks have seen this before, but I, I find this really helpful if I'm thinking about what paragraphs and how do I funnel down in my introduction section. So your first paragraph is always like about the broad area. Then you get more focused on what you're actually doing and the gap. So by the time you're done with this focus part, people could start to already guess what your paper is gonna be about. Then you actually confirm that with what did we do in the study? Generally a couple sentences. If it's a research journal, you might have an, a hypothesis, but not every journal makes you do that or wants that. So that's where looking at the journals becomes really important. And then I like to actually um, do something where I actually pull out the intended audience um, to really help the reader of who I'm trying to talk to. So I'll give you an example of that. So here's, you know, the way that I've done that in the past. So, you know, again, what we did, right, we did a multi-site pilot study. Sorry, again, very researchy, but you'll see this in my not so more descriptive papers as well. Um, here's why we did it. We wanted to provide information about the highest impact and co most cost-effective combination of scaling up this intervention for engaging patients in primary care team quality improvement work. And then here's, you know, uh, the, the last piece, right? Who's our audience? Who's this going to be useful for? So I put a really clear statement that we hope is going to be useful to people who are interested in system redesign and how do you evaluate and implement practice transformation. So, you know, I, I think that closing really helps your editor or whoever's reviewing your reviewers kind of get the sense of the scope or the fit. So again, I, you know, and I like that when I read papers too, you know, it helps me sort through, is this worth my time to keep reading as well? So now I'm gonna jump into methods. So what are the big questions on methods? So how really this is getting at, how is the gap that you identified in that, in your introduction studied, right? At the end of the day, somebody should be able to recite back to you in a single couple sentences if they read a gear method section, you know, well, you know, the gap here was this and these guys did a survey, right? Or they did some interviews. Um, we talked about doing those template articles. I often find it really helpful the articles that I found from the journal I'm publishing to often will have little subheadings under methods. And I try to see if those similar subheadings would fit. Context, study design, analysis, for example. You know, there's just real clear things that lead people through the methods. And then this is the important part. You wanna have the same level of detail as your template articles. So, so you can get really caught like getting into way too much detail about a method or too little. And some place journals are just fine with you saying we did, we use this, right? We use this kind of analysis and putting a citation. Other journals actually want you to explain it in more detail. Um, and you'll find that in the instructions of authors and with your templates. So back to the, what this looks like, right? Most methods sections will have a regulatory approval. We got IRB. Um, you, you can actually get 
caught if you got an exemption, you really want to make sure you document that. I've had a, a paper rejected because I forgot to say because it was an exemption that, oops, I didn't put the exemption number and they went through review and they're like, sorry, you rejected. We loved your paper though. Um, so something to be careful with. Um, the setting, how did you collect your data and analysis? That's the, a typical way that you might see a method section broke out. Okay, results. What are the big questions? What were the findings, right? That's really all the results are about. What did you find? Um, generally, people can get stuck as new authors. Like when do you use prime, like present tense, past tense results? A uh, convention is to always use the past tense. Um, be careful to not include any interpretation. So that's something I often see new authors do is, you know, they put in the word like surprisingly, da 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 da. This is not the place to put that in, right? Or, um, and then the, another big thing is we all have been geared towards like the significant results, but really trying to have a balanced picture. Reviewers will often say, you know, remember to say the things that were not significant that you expected to. So again, just putting those in for the methods. Okay, results. So um, another tip is really looking at your tables and figures. There's people who read papers and that's really what they clue on, not the words around it. So you, I think getting, if you have chances for having somebody else to review your papers in terms of mentors and things like that, you know, just have them read your tables and figures um, and see if they, if they're clear. Um, and then the text and the results is really where you add the additional details. Okay, last section, discussion, right? So, so what, right? That's really how I think of the discussion section. That's what you're trying to answer. Um, and you can see the questions. What are you adding, challenging, and supporting? You know, what are the unanticipated findings? What, what surprised you, right, when you did this? And how, do you, how would you explain that surprise? Um, what are the potential implications? I put in parentheses, like, if they're validated, because often, um, you know, it, you could always be a little bit too too much overstate your conclusions. So it's often nice to have a little disclaimer and be like, if other studies find this too, you know, this couldn't mean that. Um, and then what's left to learn? A, a tip is often you don't need to do a huge, big new lit search for your discussion. You've already identified the gap. So you're really referencing the same literature again and then showing how you expand it. Um, and then this important thing of, if you put something in your limitations paragraph, that you could have done, that's kind of a fatal flaw. So really try, because the reviewer will go, well, why don't you go back and do that analysis again? So um, just some quick tips about that. So this is the opposite of the pyramid we saw at the introduction, right? So it's really an inverted pyramid and the introduction, and then you're with a discussion section, we're rather than zooming in, you're actually focusing back out. So you're summarizing, you're comparing to other studies, you're talking about strengths or interesting findings, you're getting at the limitations of your work and then conclusions and Im implications. So I like the zoom in, zoom out kind of thing because when I'm doing a final review, that's really what helps me understand those papers. Did I answer those big questions um, that I you know, had put for each section and can I see that focus zooming in and out? Okay. Abstracts, right? So we all know that abstracts is your first level of review. I often always say write that last because um, this is the most important thing. I think often if we, an editor will make a decision about sending your paper out to review and people who review will only see your abstract as they're making a decision about if they want to put the time in um, to invest into reviewing your article. So you can see the big questions. Again, very similar. Why, you know, what, how, um, and what did you find? And a, a couple tips. Sometimes when you're writing it, you can mention something that's not in the manuscript. So reviewers hate that. I, you know, I've, I've made this mistake myself. Like you did something and then later in all the revisions, you took it out and you forgot to go back to the abstract. And boy, like if that was the thing that got them excited to review your article, <laughs> you, you hear about it in the review. Um, and then the abbreviations, right? Like. I made the big mistake recently in a paper, I used an abbreviation non-standard. It was like patient engagement and primary care quality improvement, right? So I was like, oh, I'll make that PEPQI. Well, nobody had heard of PEPQI. They hated this idea that I was putting PEPQI all over my article um, and it didn't, you know, get 
like published in that journal. So um, just a reminder around that QI, you could probably get away with, we all use QI, but you know, some of the non-standard abbreviations really, really be careful with that. Okay, so last little bit. Um, so what do you do at the end to find to prepare your team, right? Um, so papers can go on forever, you know, sometimes, unless you're very tight on your deadlines. I definitely suggest notifying co-authors several weeks in advance that they're going to get this draft um, so they know that's coming, right? So that's just really good form and people can sort of block their schedule like, oh, I'm going to take the time to review this back. Um, and because you have to make sure, and I said this twice because it's so important that your co-authors agree and have signed off on the content as sort of like, you know, uh, expected practice for an article, if you, it's really not fair, in my opinion, if you haven't given them like fair notice that this is coming their way, that they can read it. Um, other things that I suggest, this is just more best practices, but if a co-author makes a suggestion that you decide to not include, I generally, you know, when you're asking for edits, if it's something substantive where they actually took the time to put the comment, I do suggest emailing back like your response if you decided not to include it. It just, um, if you're working with the same teams over time, people can really feel not included or not heard. And if they don't understand why you chose not to um, incorporate their feedback. My own personal practice when I'm providing feedback as a co-author is I will sometimes put a pass. I'll say, feel free to only include whatever's useful of my edits. So then people don't have to engage in that. But if you don't have that sort of ethos around your team, then I do think that um, telling them, you know, like if they said, you need to redo the analysis and you're like, no, I'm not going to do that. You need to to let them know that. And then last thing, I, I think a good practice is really um, letting people know when they submit and actually sending them an email where they can just cut and paste the citation in their CVs. Again, just little kind things to do um, and people really appreciate that. Um, we always try to make a practice of informing everybody when things have been rejected. And if you've already agreed upon the next three journals, that can actually save a lot of time because then you can just immediately reformat and say, we're going to journal number two and you don't have to do a whole bunch of waiting. Um, also little things, right? There's these authorship forms that often journals require. If you can fill it out as much as possible, make it easy, quick click. Um, and then this CV piece, right? This is how I do it, right? Just a quick thing, you know, let's put it up. It's in press and they just can copy and paste. So tiny little things, but I do think it makes a difference in terms of our, making our co-authors lives easier and they're more willing to engage with you again on further publications. All right, <laughs> so I know we're getting at time, but this last little things I'm going to just put in the um, the chat or they're in the PowerPoint. So when we send this out, they'll be available for you. But I just wanted to mention some really awesome resources that are out there for getting started and readability that have been helpful for me. Um, I really love um, the work of this woman, Carrie Ann Rockamore, and she talks about this dealing with the curse of the blank page. I put the reference in. Um, it's really nice, and I think this was a little bit of what we heard from Kareem earlier, right? Identifying the template, which is like, you know, what, what do places look like in the journal of what you've heard, calculating the word count ratio, because you can really look at those other journals and realize, oh, introductions generally are about, you know, 500 words or whatever it is, right? So that really makes it bite size and doable, you know, and then this would be, the rest of this would be very similar, right? Make a plan of how you're going to do it with your co-authors, create some SMART goals, and then a little celebration. And I, this let it go is really important. I've worked with so many people who get really stuck, you know, on like the words and getting it perfect. That's really like, um, complicated and I get it like we all get attached to our writing after you've gotten rejected like a zillion times you don't care anymore <laughs> you're just like let's get this out the door and you know I know I'm going to get feedback and I have to revise it so as much as you can try to take to heart you know that you're going to have to make changes anyways it's not you're not going to get it perfect just let it go and then be do something nice for yourself because it was work to get it out this other um, resource in Annal of Family Medicine really is awesome about readability it really gets at um how to keep it simple, right? Um, and this is the why, right? People do better and they will remember it if we can keep our writing very simple. And this is the, my favorite thing, right? Like 
what are the measures of making your articles readable? Well, word link and familiarity, a lot of people elucidate. Every time I see that, I cringe, right? It's just explain. I just need to explain this to you, you know? So can we use some of these fancy words that have crept into sort of academic jargon? Can you take those out to make it simpler? And then really, you know, simple sentences, less comma, so, you know, really just clear declarative sentences um, and active voice. But the, there's many more tips in the article itself. So with that, I'll stop sharing screen.